Welcome to the Texas Conflict Coach radio program. If you've ever experienced or engaged in destructive or unresolved conflict, then you know it leads to broken relationships, distrust, and damaging results. Our program will help you manage and resolve conflict effectively with strategies, valuable resources, and support. Since 2009, our radio program hosted guest experts from around the globe sharing their perspectives, experiences, and expertise while giving you food for thought. If you can't listen live, then download and listen to any of our 300-plus podcasts in our library at TexasConflictCoach.com. So sit back, relax, or join the conversation every Tuesday evening, or tweet us at TX Conflict Coach. Hello, listeners. I have had a number of past episodes addressing family business and the various differences that can create conflict. Now, family businesses move through many transitions as they grow from founders to much larger family enterprise systems. The components of this shift include, among others, a range of family dynamic issues that can derail business or families, clarifying roles, committing to various business competencies, reaching agreements about reasonable expectations, and building solid governance structures or creating a solid plan for continuity. Most of the critical landscape issues get caught within the porous boundary between family and business. They are places where history and differences are triggers for behaviors and require everyone to gain an ability to engage in thoughtful and constructive conversations, meetings, or retreats. So in our episode, Navigating the Family Business Landscape, I have joining me Anne Begler. Now, Ann Beigler helps individuals and organizations create both the vision and structures essential to forward movement. She is the founder and principal of the Begler Group, a Pittsburgh consulting firm that, through its work, builds and restores human connection, fosters individual accountability, supports personal development, and culminates in energized and aligned organizations. The insight and skill Ann brings to her clients is built on a long career of personal and professional training and growth. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Pittsburgh, followed by her law degree from Duquesne University School of Law. After working for several years as a practicing lawyer and completed initial and advanced training in mediation and other forms of conflict management processes, Anne left her practice of law in 2000 to devote her full attention to organizational consulting, mediation, conflict management, and executive coaching. She's consulted to and coached and advised for a range of complex family enterprise systems, corporations, professional practices, nonprofit organizations, and various segments of the municipal government. So, Anne, we welcome you to our program. Thanks, Patty. It's great to be here. Well, we've been working on getting you on the program for about a year, so it's wonderful that we've been able to align our stars to uh, get you here. And I want to let uh, let callers know uh, and listeners know that we are taking live callers tonight. And if you're already in the studio, which we have a couple of people in the studio now, uh, just press number one if you would like to uh, talk to Ann and I or ask a question, make a comment. We also have our chat room open, and if you are um, near your computer, and you just simply go to blogtalkradio.com forward slash Texas conflict dash coach, and you'll just scroll down. You'll see that the chat room is open now. That's another way to engage with us, and if you're on the computer and you want to call us, 347 347- Three two four three five nine one. Again, press one if you have a comment or question. So, Anne, let's get started. Then, um, what you know, I think listeners want to know. You have a rich, long history in the work that you do. So, what motivated you to do the dynamic work that you do with family businesses? Um, well, first of all, I grew up in a family business, so I have a long history of um, just being involved in the way family businesses work. And, you know, I guess a lot of the work I do, whether with family businesses or other kinds of things, seems to really be about restoring and building relationships. I don't know, there's something about uh, helping families build legacy that just really appeals to me. And, you know, I, I don't think I've ever worked with a family where the earlier generation and at least many in a generation to come don't value legacy and don't have either a direct or a silent hope about having this family business go on. And it's, um, 
you know, it always feels like a privilege to be able to bring what I have to help families make that happen. So, you know, I, I introduce listeners to a, a little bit about your background and edu- education. Is there anything more about your background which helps you to do this work that we haven't talked about already? You know, it's a funny thing. You you talked about some of the, you know, points in, in family business landscapes, and it's interesting to me because along with law and mediation conflict management, it seems that, that my journey really has other touchstones that really um, – you know, are aligned with family business work. I have a pretty extensive training in gestalt therapy. I've done certificate programs in organizational development, group process work, and energy and body work. And I've done a pretty comprehensive training in executive coaching. And and all of those things um, are very alive um, when we're trying to build family enterprise systems. All of all of those skills, along with understanding the law and knowing a lot about conflict. Now, a lot of people are, gonna, are not going to know about Gestalt therapy, which is a pretty, you know, intensive type of therapy. But to say just a little bit about what Gestalt therapy is and and uh, and how does that fit into, you know, because you call it a touchstone. How does that fit into the work you do as a fa- in family business systems? Well, there, it's you know we won't have time on one show to talk a lot about it, but I would just say that it's a first, it's a very experiential process. And it centers a lot around um, seeing resistance as a positive force. And it centers a lot around um, understanding something that we call figure formation. Something stands out for us, and that's become so illuminated that other things recede into the background. So helping people understand the things that stand out for them and what they might be missing is one of the hallmarks of, of Gestalt therapy. Um, And at the center is paying attention to how we meet other people, how we meet our environment, and what we do to inhibit ourselves from doing that. So it's really about contact and engagement. That's really. But what I love about your the various touchstones is that you very multidisciplinary in your approach to how you deal with family business enterprise because it is such a complex. Thing. And so let's talk about the dynamics and differences that create conflict in family businesses. Say more about these dynamics. Well, I think that, you know, one of the first dynamics, and, and I don't know if some of your other guests may have talked about this as well, is that it's a place where we have overlapping circles. We have a family and we have a business, and where they overlap, a lot of stuff happens, where those boundaries aren't so clear. And so often we have people who um, can't make any boundaries, and a lot of stuff happens. And other times we have people who get very rigid about boundaries. It's only about the business. It's only about the family or never about the business and never about the family. And so a real challenge is to help everybody across generations build more capacity to hold concepts like both and instead of either or. And to do that in a way that boundaries also become clear. And then, you know, along with that, you have people who are often in multiple roles. So I might be a shareholder, and I might be on a board, and I might work in a business. And so when issues come up, understanding what role one is functioning in at what time becomes a really complicated uh, challenge. Well, you you know, for those who are very visual, being that we're a radio show and, uh, you know, and we're listening and, I, you know, I'm here, I'm drawing these overlapping circles, you know, that cross over. So right. what are examples of these areas that cross over that cause potential conflict where conversation is really needed? Well, sure. I, I'll, I'll give you a, a recent example. So I uh, work with a family business where... One of the siblings is a shareholder, doesn't work in the business, wants to understand more, and decides that that person will just go to the business office, go see the CFO of the business, and ask the CFO to review with that person all of the integral financial aspects of the business. Mm. So it doesn't happen in a shareholder's meeting. This person really isn't functioning as a board member but is a shareholder who's interested and doesn't have a consciousness about what happens for the CFO when that person walks in without going to the sibling who really runs the business and starts to ask for a lot of information. Yet in that person's experience, without talking about this, you know, that person thinks, well, I own this business. Why can't I go get what I want? 
Mm. And, and, and what is their motivation for doing that? Um, Want to know if the president's really making good decisions, might have a disagreement with a, about a strategy that the person heard about, um, just wants to become more informed. Um, okay. Wants to hear it right from the finance person. And yet they, they have this, and this is where the boundary, you know, the, the boundary is a little bit uh, somewhat loose maybe, uh, and that's where you were talking about are those boundaries too rigid, too loose, and also, you know, what is their role? So that was, is well, there sure, another? Sure, because, because when, that, when that happens, the CFO is sitting there saying, well, geez, I, I report to the CEO. I didn't know this person was coming in. I don't know how this family talks about money. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to even give this information. Mm -hmm. Well, should I call the CEO right now, or should I give this person, you know, an overview of the books? So it creates a lot of tension inside the organization itself when, when something like that happens. Okay. What other common dynamics, um, kind of this crossover, what is another example? Well, you know, there, there's... Um, you know, there's an, an interesting graph of a, a family business landscape that I think does a really nice job of highlighting a lot of these areas. And I think if I run through them quickly, you'll you'll just see the range of things that can happen. So you have, fam you have family business roles that often aren't clear in terms of their roles in the business, and you have people who want to do certain things, and yet they're not competent to do certain things. You have issues about whether spouses and extended family members can be involved. You, have, you often have a history of family dynamics um, where there has been conflict, there have been issues that haven't been talked about, people make assumptions, and all of those things then spill into the family business. Um, you, you have differences about, um, depending on generations, um, whether or not things like competency and skill are important or whether people get jobs because they're family members. You have governance issues where some people think it's really critical to finally get a functioning board in place with outside people and other people don't want any outside input from into the family you know, business at all. And um, you have questions about whether everybody in the family should ultimately have an ownership or whether or not only people who work there should be owners. You know, whether it's critical to have a family member be a successor to be a CEO or president, whether people have a tolerance for outside family members, how these things tie into estate plans, where in many families this comes up in the business and children and parents have never even talked about the estate planning aspect of that family. So the when you, you have all of those issues, and then you overlay them with what often has to be a culture shift from generation to generation because needs change and are different in terms of keeping the business going and moving toward that enterprise system that, that it's going to take. Because in an early stage, you have one business that's supporting one family, and suddenly you have five siblings, and you have the same business that needs to support five families. And then you have ten cousins, you know, and you have more families. So there, there's a lot of work that has to be done as you transition through these succession plans. And especially if the family business continues to grow, you know, I could, you could easily see where things could get out of control or become very embedded over a period of time. Um, so a lot of uh, areas rich for conversation and rich for conflict to escalate. Uh, and to get very uh, positional and even destructive. And I'm sure that in your years of work in this area that you've seen a lot of things that you've had to help them unravel. Yeah, I mean, it just it happens all the time. And, and all of these areas really need thoughtful conversations. They need, a, you know, a breadth of dialogue. And they're places where people are really scared to talk. Mm, mm-hmm. Okay, so before we move on, um, listeners who are tuned in right now, you are tuned in to the Texas Conflict Coach Blog Talk Radio Program, and we're talking with Ann Bagler with the Bagler Group out of Pittsburgh about navigating the family business landscape. So we, we talked about a number of areas in this landscape where there's a lot of overlap or there's areas where conflict and uh, conversation really need to be occurring and they need to be occurring sooner than later uh, in, in, in really a lot of different uh, areas. And, uh, and so what are some of the 
in your experience in working with these family businesses, and I'm sure you've seen some patterns develop, some themes developed uh, that are common from family business to family business, regardless of the type of business. So what are some guiding principles to help family businesses stay the course? Um, I think the first one is to remember that it's never just business or just family. That everything, whether you're talking about the family, you're talking about the business, you have to really keep a both and uh, mentality. You have to always know that both are important, they're linked together, and it's never really one or the other. I think it's really important. Uh, a lot of people who do this work say, well, we're, we're just going to work on the business. Um, for me, though, it's really important to also do some work on the family, to be very clear about what your mission is as a family, because that is the overarching um, vision. And your business, you're going to do a lot of traditional business work, but what you do in your business has to also be aligned with what's important to you as a family. So what's your family mission and your values and your principles and how, you'll con and how will you conduct yourselves as a family? Um, I think it's helpful to um, think about things like inclusion-exclusion dynamics because those are often operative in family systems and they play out in the business, people who get included and people that, who don't. And if you're going to try to create a continuity plan that works, you have to really work against that inclusion-exclusion factor and you really are trying to build a large collaborative group. And I guess the other thing, and the thing that I see a gap in a lot, is when, when we run into situations that are really, really hard, it really begs for an internal leader who's really strong and who really has a passion to build a legacy and to change culture. And we're often talking about systems that are founded by entrepreneurs who never saw themselves as leaders, never saw the necessity of being a leader. Um, and so there's a lot of work around leadership development, but it, it, your advisor can't do the work. Your advisor is a big support and a big help, but you really, you really do need, as with any organization, that you've got to have an internal champion. Why do you think that that's a gap? Why is that a theme? You know, it sounds like you're seeing that. What do you think is happening there that you see that? more often? Well, I think typically you have a founder who starts a small business and thinks of himself or herself as a business person. And there's a lot of, um, you know, people, you know, take expenses and they write them off in the business. And I mean, all kinds of things happen at that level. And then, and then you get to a sibling level generally where it's pretty natural that these, this group of children kind of become involved and own the business, but there's still kind of an emphasis more on family than business. And then suddenly, as you start to move through that generation and shift, there's a big change because you have to become more business focused, not that you're leaving family aside, but you have to start to really do things like develop competency requirements and develop market-based salaries because the finances change. You might have three children who work there, three cousins who work there and three cousins who don't, but they all have to benefit from the finances of the business. So you can't just pay yourself what you want. You have to begin to go to market-based salaries and you have to build in really sustainable accountability systems. And that's, those are often really big culture changes. And it, it takes a leader to really drive that. Really you know, it's interesting. For that change. You know, it's interesting that you said that. I was talking to some recent business owners, family business owners, who were mm -hmm. saying um, that, you know, let, let's say it's uh, you know brother sister, and uh, and let's say a, a distant relative. You mentioned cousin, and cousin gets X amount of salary, right? Just an arbitrary salary that's not market based, and that person doesn't do anything. And yet they, you know, they, the initial start of that conversation is not, you know, uh, what you deserve based on your skill level and competency based on the market, but just, you know, hey, you're a family member, we're going to give you this much. And then over time, that person was doing less and less and less and less, and their salary was not, um, you know, equal to what the market was or even fair uh, to what everybody else was doing. So I'm glad that you brought up about the, is this a market-based salary, especially as the businesses are growing. Well, you know what, and that, that's a great example because often a gap in a family like that is they've never had conversations about the need to shift the culture. 
that have never done things like have guidance around, around developing a family protocol or a charter that covers all of these issues. They haven't talked about why the shift in compensation thinking is really important. And so then when they go to have a conversation, it feels and becomes a lot more personal. It's not tied in with any kind of an organizational principle that's essential for continuity. Okay. There's no now, guidepost for it. Yeah, and it's it's amazing that you would think in a business, your, your typical traditional business, they have these charters, they have these guidelines, they have these policies, they have these all of these things in place. And, and, uh, and a lot of times you see family businesses, especially if they started out small and then they really started to grow, that they didn't, you know, talk about these things. Maybe there were some assumptions that were being made, some you know, kind of hidden uh, rules uh, about how the family functions, you know, and uh, and so unfortunately that can end them up in trouble later down the road, which is where you come in. Now, you often refer yourself at, to, to family businesses that contact you as what? How do you refer to yourself? Um, I, I think of myself as a family business advisor or consultant. That's That's pretty traditional in the field. Okay, so let's talk about when they come to you as a family business advisor or consultant, they usually come into you because there's some type of problem or conflict. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, they've either had an awakening that, gee, I'm now X years old and I better do something, or a younger, younger a person in a younger generation it comes, it calls and says, you know, my family's not talking about this at all, and I don't know if the business is going to continue or not, and I don't even know who owns what. I have no idea what my role is going to be, and I have to try to get our family to talk about this. Um, it's usually that kind of an entry point, or they've had some effort at some conversation, and it's ended up in an explosion. So do you find that when the initial person who contacts you to possibly bring you in, that you encounter resistance from other family members about bringing an outsider into the family business to, to have these conversations? Um, I think sometimes there's resistance, but, but by the time I'm actually going, there's been a family conversation and an agreement that it's time for them to talk to someone. And so what I typically do is go in and do a short presentation and talk just a little bit in general about family businesses and try to understand what they need. So at that point, it's a, it's a pretty calm entry point. Okay, so it's not like you're, you know, someone's bringing bringing you in, and uh, and not that you're kicking and screaming, but uh, that the others are kicking and screaming. <laughs> yeah, you know, because no, usually at that point, know, it's like there's there's been a recognition that hey, we really we could really use some help here some help here. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So as a family business advisor and, and a consultant to these businesses, um, there's a number of very specific strategies. Because one of the things that you know we try to do on this program is to raise awareness, to educate uh, to our listeners. You know, If they're in a family business and you're listening to this and you're like, well, what's one strategy? What's one tip? What's one resource that will help my family business you know, maintain or even approach a constructive way of dealing with some of these conflicts. What are some things um, that you would offer to our listeners now? Well, look, I, I think on an emotional level, I would say don't let fear stop you from getting help. I mean, making that first call and getting information is really important. The earlier, you know, a family can begin to work on these issues, the better, because that lets you um, take the time you need and it lets you take small steps. It doesn't feel nearly as overwhelming. I think there, there are a lot of, depending on where people live, there are a lot of resources for family businesses. For, for instance, in Pittsburgh, we have a fantastic program through the business school at the University of Pittsburgh um, that's gone from just a family business component to an institute for entrepreneurial enterprises. And they have a lot of seminars. So if you're a family business, just joining that kind of a group, becoming involved with other people who are in family businesses, I think is incredibly helpful because it begins to normalize some of the dynamics that we see often just across the spectrum of family businesses. And suddenly that alone starts to depersonalize some of the things people experience. So what do you think, that, I'm going to come, come back to the first strategy of the step is, is not letting fear stop them from getting help. What's the fear about then? 
Well, I think the fear is about there will be a big conflict that will break up the family if we start to talk about these things. You know, there's been often there's been a culture of conflict avoidance or a lack of skill development uh, about how to do these things. Um, I think sometimes uh, people are concerned. You know, it takes, you know, like for any anybody who's in business, it takes time to work on the business and in the business. And, you know, when people are spending, you know, hours and hours and hours just working in their business, trying to sort through how they would ever do this work, I think creates a lot of fear. Um, some people are afraid the whole family will blow apart if they just start this work. Um, so I, I think different fears are operational for different people. And sometimes it's not fear. Sometimes people just actually don't know there's a way to get help. And I, think, I think, unfortunately, you know, people often will go to a, a tax lawyer or an estate planning lawyer, which is important and always, I think, a, a critical part of a team for an advisor doing this work. Often the people, those kinds of advisors, don't really help families have the conversations they need to have. You know, so they'll, what, they'll so put a plan together, but they won't have a family talk about the impact of the plan on the family. So you mentioned then earlier because, you know, you said they need to, you know, and we say that about any conflict is how do you address it early on? And you said, and said for people reaching out, making the first call. So who are they calling generally? Well, sometimes they're, they're, they're not calling about – sometimes they're calling first an estate planning lawyer. I think I'm in an age where I probably should revise my will, and I have to figure out if I'm going to leave this business to my kids or do something else. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, last year when the, when the federal tax law was still up in the air in the United States, it was, gee, I better, I better talk to the accountant or the lawyer because I'm afraid I have too much money and I'm really going to get hit if they change the tax law. And, you know, and so these, these financial and legal plans get put into place, and only later the family understands sometimes the implication of some of the plans on family members. And, and so some of those things that you're talking about, like the taxes, the money, the estate planning, it, you know, in their minds it makes sense, okay, let's reach out to the estate, you know, planning, uh, you know, attorney or the CPA or something. But what if the conflict is really around these roles, the succession? Who do they normally think of calling or should be calling as a resource? One is a family well, business advisor like yourself, but... Right. They, they, should be, they should be looking for an advisor or a consultant who really has an understanding about the dynamics of family businesses and who is somebody who can really help them have the kinds of conversations they need to have and also build the structures that support those conversations. Now, I do know that they're, just like yourself, you're a, a mediator uh, and probably use that strategy as appropriate depending on what case you're working on. I do know a number of family business mediators who their only specialty um, is, their, is mediating, working with family businesses, and that's their specialty area. Um, you have a real broad range uh, in the sense that you're an advisor and a consultant and might use various strategies in, as you're helping, because obviously these can be very complex areas that are interwoven together. Um, so is there a not, you mentioned the one in Pittsburgh, is there a more national resource or something that is in each state where family businesses can reach out? No, there isn't one in each state. There's a national organization called the Family Firm Institute. It's actually an international organization. Um, and there is, I think, an institute for wealth management where a lot of family business issues are discussed and, and get some attention. Uh, I think there are a range of mediators who work with family. One place where mediation happens, unfortunately, is family businesses get in litigation. Mm. And, you know, that's a sad state when that happens. But that's a very, very appropriate place for what we would think of as classic mediation. You know, okay. if you're not going to stay together and you're going to break up, don't duke it out in the courtroom. There, there are mediators who, could, who are really skilled at sitting down and helping you work out a solution. Yeah, they can because they get when very, you, when very you nasty. Get into litigation. You know, it's not just about losing a business. You know, fam families, and I think they do understand that these things impact families through generations. And it means that the children, you know, who are 8 and 10 today, 
stand the strong likelihood that they won't have any kind of a relationship with their cousins when these mm-hmm. things fall apart. Mm-hmm. So what am I not asking you as we start to come to a close? What am I not asking you that you wished I would have asked you about this topic? You mean like what am I going to think, be thinking about when I get in the shower tonight, huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> Oh, I, 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 you know, this, I, this is a very, um, this is very intimate work, and we could probably have a long talk about. It. I wonder if that's what's so hard about families doing this because there are just so many intimacy issues in having these conversations. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I can just say as an advisor, it always feels like a privilege to do this work because you are really close to the hearts of a lot of different kinds of individuals in the business. And a lot of struggles people have trying to make this work. You know, you you really, as we do in all kinds of places, I guess, but you really see people at their best and you see people at their worst. And um, these are these are lifelong relationships. This is not a situation where you go in and you do something and you never have contact with a family again. You know, I have families I've worked with for two or three years and they, they do a, a protocol that looks like it's really, really going to work. And then they don't do anything for a couple of years, and then suddenly something happens, and and you're back there again. So this is, you know, this is a lifetime relationship when it works well. Mm, I think that's good. important to know and understand. That intimacy and, and the vulnerability that they have to be in when they have those kinds of honest conversations, hard conversations. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, Anne, as we close, uh, there's a couple things I want listeners to know. One is we encourage our guests to give some type of call to action or assignment for the week so that listeners take that next step, especially if they're in a family business. What do you have for them? Well, I have kind of a simple one, I think. So I would say for people who are in a family business who are trying to sort through, you know, do I do, I do this or don't I do this, I would do a very simple hopes and fears list, you know. I would say... If I decide I'm not going to work on a plan, what's my greatest hope and what's my greatest fear? And if we start to work on a plan and commit to this, what's my greatest hope and what's my greatest fear? And look at those together and just see what comes up. Pay attention to what happens and do some self-reflection about it. See where you're inspired to move. Okay, wonderful. So listeners, you have your assignment for the week. And um, and how can folks best find you that want to reach out to you? Um, I'll give you my office number is area code 412-391-4000. And um, my email is just abegler at aol.com. Um, and I would just say, if you're going to email me, you know, put in the subject line, you know, blog talk radio. Um, okay, a begler at aol.com. I'm saying, sorry to right. put what in the subject line again? Well, blog talk radio or something. Oh, okay. So All right, I, very I, good. I know it's coming from your show, Patty. Okay, very good. All right, so uh, folks who are listening, we have all of Anne's uh, information at TexasConflictCoach.com. This is a a, a program that will become a podcast, part of the library of family businesses, and so you'll be able to listen to it, uh, to share this program, uh, and it will be there indefinitely. Uh, This is is a free uh, service that we provide to the community. Before we go to the final message, I did want to make a special announcement, and uh, that is next year. Tuesday, April 1st, is our fifth anniversary producing the Texas Conflict Coach and our 200th episode. Yay! (laughs) So we hope that you join us. We are going to have a special limited edition giveaway uh, for those who are participating uh, live on the program. And uh, and so we'll give more information to our social media network, so be listening for that. But uh, we're so excited to uh, have been doing this uh, program uh, for five years as a community education, and as a way to give back. And it's, it's people like Anne who give of their time and their expertise and is so generous in, uh, in educating uh, people around the world uh, you know, on this radio show, and so Anne, I really appreciate so much of your generosity and your time uh, to give to to us and, and to share your message. And so, on that note, what is your final message that you want to leave with listeners? Uh, 
Um, I, I think I would say vision is important. And if you, if you really want your family business to continue to grow and to move through generations, hold strong a vision of legacy. And be a champion of optimism. Ah, very good. Well, I want to thank our listeners for joining us in the chat room and in our live in our studio and uh, Twitter feed tonight. Thank you, Anne, again for uh, joining us. You're welcome. Thank you, Patty. Thank you for listening to the Texas Conflict Coach. We hope you've enjoyed the program. You can find over 300 podcasts archived to listen at your own convenience at texasconflictcoach.com or download the podcast at iTunes or Stitcher Radio. To learn about upcoming radio programs and resources, sign up for our monthly e-newsletter.